<laughs> so, at this morning, I just want to begin by asking us all a question, simple question, really. Uh, do we know God? You know, we come to church on a Sunday to worship God, to praise God, to listen to the Word of God. Uh, we pray to God in our daily lives and everything, but uh, my question is, do we know God? You don't need to answer now. Um, just keep this in mind, and then we'll come back to it as we listen to the Word of God today. Um, in fact, today we're going to talk about someone, or we're going to look at the life of someone <coughs> who knew God. But uh, this particular person whom we find, who we find in the Bible is someone who is famous, um, not for knowing God, not for his knowledge of God, but uh, let's say, when we mention his name, and in fact, I will mention his name in a few seconds, um, usually we think about anything other than, oh, he knew God really well. You know, we think about the fact that he was uh, stubborn, that he was re uh, rebellious, that he was disobedient to God. So I've given you a clue of who we're, we're going to talk about. And yeah, this person... It's none other than Jonah, the prophet Jonah. So uh, let's open our Bibles and let's read something in the first chapter of the book of Jonah. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 3. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, uh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So we read that um, the word of God came to Jonah or that God spoke to Jonah, uh, commissioning Jonah to do something specific. So uh, God purposely spoke to Jonah, who was a prophet. So by definition, he uh, received, um, let's say, messages from God, and then he would speak out the mind or the message, that, uh, the, the mind of God or the message that God um, gave him to deliver unto others. In this particular instance, we realize, we read that the word of God came to Jonah to do something, to go to Nineveh, to speak against them, to, to tell the people in this place uh, called Nineveh that, well, God has seen your sin. Your sin is so great that it has uh, come before God, and God is going to do something about it. Gonna, God is going to uh, kind of uh, execute his judgment upon you because of your sin, because of your great sin. And you would expect that, well, he's a prophet, so God speaks to him, or God tells him something, and he does it. But then we read here that the Lord, the, the word of God came to Jonah, but Jonah, instead of uh, just heeding to God's command and going to Nineveh, he had decides to go to a different place altogether. In fact, if we analyze or if we look into um, the place where he was supposed to go and the place that he decided to go, uh, Tarshish, we realized that he was going directly in the opposite direction. And so he didn't just obey, uh, disobey to God's instruction or God's command, but he uh, disobeyed it in quite a sensational way because he went or he was going uh, about 2,500 uh, miles in the opposite direction. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that as he did that, as he disobeyed to God, um, he got on the ship. Um, he got on the ship, he, uh, they, they started sailing towards Tarshish, and then the Lord caused a great storm to uh, raise against the ship itself. So the, the captain and the crew, they were all, they were all desperate. They thought they were going to die. Everybody, everyone, or each one of them was calling to uh, their God, uh, hoping to be saved. And in the meanwhile, uh, Jonah was in a ship, sleeping, snoring, <laughs> not knowing what was going on. But when they woke him up, he realizes that all that is going on was going on because 
of him and because of his disobedience. So uh, he ends up confessing um, to the, the rest of the crew that, oh, this is going on because of me. So do you know what? Just throw me into the sea and save yourselves. Throw me into the sea and I'm sure uh, this storm will stop. The, uh, the crew, the captain and the others, they uh, reluct- reluctantly um, ended up doing what Jonah asked them because they didn't want to have uh, the blood of an innocent person on their hands. But then in the end, they end up throwing him into the sea. The storm subsides. We read that um, Jonah is then swallowed by a big fish, not a whale. <laughs> the Bible doesn't state that it was a whale. That a big, that, uh, by a big fish, he stays in the belly of this big fish for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights in which he has uh, the opportunity to uh, repent from his disobedience. And then once he's put out uh, on dry land after these three days and three nights, we read in Jonah chapter uh, 3 that the word of God comes to Jonah once more, that God speaks to Jonah once more, gives him the same instruction basically to go to Nineveh, speak against them because of their great sin. Jonah this time heeds God's command, he goes And he speaks um, the word that God had told him to speak. When he does that, all the, um, the the Bible says that the people of Nineveh believe God. This was a pagan uh, nation, a pagan society. You know, they didn't believe in God. Um, We will later on see uh, see, uh, a a little bit about how, how ruthless they were, you know. And the sin was great indeed. But then upon hearing what Jonah was speaking to them, the Bible tells us that they believed, that they fasted, uh, they mourned, the king even um, decreed a three-day fast that no one should eat from the um, smallest to the, 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 the oldest. Nobody should eat, nobody should drink for three days. And he said, who knows if God uh, would then have mercy and relent, you know, uh, from his judgment. As they did indeed repent and they um, mourned and fasted for those three days, the Bible tells us that God saw and he relented from releasing his judgment upon Nineveh. And you will think, well, you're a servant of God. You speak God's word to God's people. They repent. You know, let's celebrate. You know, your ministry or your word or what you've done has led to the salvation of people. You should be happy about it. But Jonah wasn't happy about it. In fact, let's read in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So Jonah, as we just read here, he wasn't happy at all (laughs) that the Ninevites had been saved, that God had relented from releasing his judgment upon them. Uh, He wasn't happy at all. He wasn't happy that God had been gracious, had been merciful, and he has showed them uh, love. And the reason, um, we find the reason in what um, the Assyrians represented or the Ninevites represented in those days, in the time of Jonah. Um, The Assyrian Empire, though it was... um, an empire that rose up or started uh, small, it, it had grown over time to become a great empire, and it had done that with means of terror and great wickedness. And in fact, um, amongst the uh, hideous things that they did was the invention of um, the execution of their enemies uh, by impaling them, you know, and leaving them there hanging. 
until they died. And they used to do this to thousands and thousands of enemies at once, you know. And growing as, as, as they were, the, the Assyrians, they had, of which indeed um, Nineveh was, was the capital, they were posing or they posed as, as a threat to, to Israel, as, as a constant threat to, to Israel. So Jonah, knowing all this, thought, well, these people are definitely not worth saving. They don't deserve um, the mercy, the grace, the goodness, the love of our God, the God of Israel. So he knew this, but then he also knew God. Jonah didn't just know that the Ninevites or the Assyrians were uh, a terrible people, but then he knew that his God was a good God. He was a merciful God. He was a kind God. He was a God who would always like to save and so he was sure that if he went and he had spoken and these people had repented, then the God that he knew would have relented from executing judgment. And how did Jonah know this? Uh, Jonah didn't know this just because, or, or he didn't know God just because people had told him of God. Jonah was a prophet of God, like we said. And so as a prophet, like we said earlier on, he was a mouthpiece of God or a spokesperson for God. He uh, would have walked with God. He um, was used to speaking and communicating with uh, his God. We read, we, we, we don't have um, a lot of information from the Bible on, on Jonah and his origins um, before what we read in the book of Jonah. But we read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 14 that Jonah prophesied. Um, during the reign of, 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 Jerobo, of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And let's read what the Bible says in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 14, verse 23 to 25. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of uh, Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, um, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of, um, of Arabah, according to the, world, the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath. Heifer. So um, we just read of Jonah um, prophesying during the reign of this king um, of Israel, this king called uh, Jeroboam. And the Bible tells us that he began to reign in Samaria. He reigned for 41 years and that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord because he did not depart from the sins of another king um, who was named just as he was, Jeroboam, the son, this time not of Joash, but of Nebat. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was a king of Israel who um, led the Israelites to worship idols, once again, or to idol worshiping um, by building, indeed, or um, making the, his people build um, two golden cows so that... Um, Basically, his people, the people of, of, um, of Israel would have not gone to um, Jerusalem to worship at the temple after the kingdom was divided. And so this led the people of God to idol, to idol worshiping, which uh, was an abomination to God. It was something that God hated. When years and years after, almost a hundred years after, um, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, became king. He didn't um, lead the people of Israel back to God, but they kept on with idol worshiping. And so the Bible tells us that he did what was evil in the sight of God. Nevertheless, 
In spite, he was doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Bible makes us understand when we read <clears throat> two kings that in those times, Israel was going through a time of affliction and of loss. And the Lord chose to be nevertheless gracious to Israel. So even when they didn't deserve it because they were a sinful people, they were people who, was, um, who were worshipping other gods, God prophesied or spoke to them through none other than Jonah that he was going to uh, extend their territory. And in fact, he extended the territory to um, great proportions, to the proportions that the kingdom used to be uh, under Solomon. So Jonah had witnessed firsthand God's grace in action. He saw a people, even though they were God's people, they didn't deserve God's goodness. But God chose to be good to them anyway. And so coming back to Nineveh, Jonah knew that God was a gracious God. And in fact, that was, that's what he said in his own words in Jonah chapter 4 verse 1. That he knew God to be a gracious God, merciful, um, abounding in steadfast love. And relenting, you know, from destruction. So my question to you again is, do we know God or do you know God? Do we know God not um, knowing God from what we've read from the Bible? Not knowing God from what we've heard from someone else's testimony? Not knowing God from what we've heard, you know, from a preaching on a Sunday? Do we know God? Because we have, just like Jonah did, experienced God for ourselves. Um, Tony, can you just pull up the, the picture for me, please? I'm sure a few of us are giggling now because of the man on the screen. And yeah, this is um, Rowan Atkinson, or many of us know him as Mr. Bean. Do you know Mr. Bean? Do you know, no actually, do you know Rowan Atkinson? We can say, thank you Tony, we can say that, yeah, he is um, a funny man. He's a good actor. He's successful. You might say he's rich. But these are all things that we know, not because um, we're friends with him, not because we have lived life with him, not because we are part of his, you know, his family, or anything, not because we are close to him, but there are things that we know because, let's say, he's um, a public figure. He, he's a famous person. We've seen him on TV. We've seen him on YouTube. We've seen him on, uh, on, on many videos. We've seen him at the cinema. And so, of the things that we know of him, probably, most of us, maybe there's someone who knows him, or maybe he's watching this video. Who knows? <laughs> but of the things that we know of him, probably the only thing we've experienced is the part that um, he's a funny guy or he's a funny actor, you know, because he's made us all laugh uh, in one way or the other through his sketches. But then who can say that they really know Rowan Atkinson? It's just the people that have lived life with him. So maybe his wife, his, uh, his children, his friends, his family. But you and I, all we know <laughs> is what we see on the internet or on the TV. We know him. Maybe we've got an intellectual, uh, an intellectual knowledge of him. But we've not got an experiential uh, knowledge of him. Other than what we've experienced again, which is um, he being a funny actor through what we've seen on television or through different um, videos. Knowing God doesn't come from just reading about God. Knowing God doesn't just come from I'm hearing about God. Knowing God comes from experiencing God. Otherwise, 
then anybody in the world at all could say, well, I know God because uh, I read an article about him. Or my friend, my Christian friend always talks to me about God. So since he speaks, God is like this, God is this, God is that. I know God. It doesn't work like that. Knowing God comes from experiencing God for ourselves. So how have you experienced God or how have you known God in the years of, uh, of being a Christian or in the months of being a Christian? You know, sometimes I think we, um, we never get to the place, you know, of uh, knowing God the way we should because we don't commit to living a life with God. But then knowing God comes with, um, with its benefits, you know? Knowing God comes with having uh, an intimacy of relationship with God. An intimacy in which, yes, you get to know God better. You get to know who God is. You get to know how God is. And in that, you get to even know yourself better. There's nobody that knows you better than God knows you because he made you. And it is in intimacy with him that God reveals more of himself to you. But as he does that, he also reveals more of who you are to you. And as he does that, he takes away the bad and he shapes you into a better version of you. The more we grow in intimacy with God, the more he... Uh, we get to know him, and the more we allow him also to show us who we are and to shape us, the better people we become. We become the versions, more and more um, the versions that God created us to be. One, 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 um, a person that we read about in the Bible who um, had a really strong relationship with God, and we can say, indeed, knew God, was um, David. And David, and David knew God, the Bible tells us that he, he was the man that knew God in, that, in, in such a way that he was even considered, or God said that he was a, a man after his own heart. And David wanting to even be more with God, more and more than he already used to be. In Psalm 139, we read that he said, to, he told the Lord to test him, he told the Lord to search him, he told the Lord to um, reveal all the wicked ways that were in his heart so that the Lord could shape him and lead him into the way everlasting or to lead him into, let's say, the place where God was or where God is. By getting to know God more, we get to have also a deeper knowledge and understanding of God's ways. For example, going back to Jonah, Jonah knew God. He knew God's ways. And he knew that God uh, sending him to speak that message it was because ultimately God wanted to save the people of Nineveh. So he knew how God worked. Hadn't he, knew, hadn't he known God, uh, he would have just said, well, uh, the Lord said this, L let me just go because judgment is coming upon these people. But since he knew God, he knew that God's ultimate plan was saving these people. That's why, like we said, he disobeyed, he disobeyed to God's command. The more we get to know God, the more we understand God's ways, the more we also um, grow in faith and trust in the Lord, and the more we learn to rely upon God in many and many different ways. One thing I love um, about the Old Testament um, uh, the so-called um, compound names of God, names that tells out, tells us, tell us about the character uh, of God, tell us about who God is. And, for example, we find um, names like Jireh, which means the Lord, our provider. And so the more you um, live life with God, realizing that God indeed provides for you when you need something, then 
you can say, oh, the Lord is my provider. So you get to know God as your provider and you rely upon him when you, need, when you are in need of something because you know that indeed God is your provider. Another name that we find for God in the Old Testament is Rapha, which means the Lord, um, my healer. If you um, rely upon God for healing and then you indeed receive healing in God, then you can say the Lord is my healer because you have experienced him as your healer. It's not because you just read it. It's not because you just heard it, but it is because you have lived it. We read about God being shalom, God my peace. And indeed, if you have been through um, a storm in your life, hardship, hurt, pain in your life, and you couldn't find peace anywhere, but then you found peace in God because you have realized that relying upon him, God gave you peace. Then you get to know God as indeed your peace, your shalom. And then you get to rely upon him even in the future or even in uh, other instances in, in which you are in desperate need of something like that of such peace. Talking about David once again, um, the most famous of the, of the Psalms probably is Psalm 23. And it begins with David saying, the Lord is my shepherd. He didn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He didn't say the Lord is the shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. It is a Psalm that he wrote based on his own knowledge and his own uh, experiential knowledge of God. He, has ex he had experienced God as being a shepherd to him, just as he was a shepherd to uh, his own sheep. So can you say the Lord is my shepherd, not because you're quoting the verse or um, the psalm, but because you have experienced God to be a shepherd to you? Can we say the Lord is my, and then add something, an, an, um, an adjective, that describes who God is to us, that describes what we have uh, learned uh, of God by living our lives with God. Do we know God for ourselves? Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. Maybe we just know a little about God. Maybe we know a lot about God. Maybe we don't know anything at all about God. But the thing is, if we don't know God, it's not too late. If we know just a little about God, then there is time to get to know more. If we think we know a lot about God, well, there is still a whole lot to get to know about God. It wasn't too late for the Ninevites. And so when the, Lord, the word of God came to them, it was because the Lord wanted to save them. And so if you are watching us this morning and you don't know God, well, it's not too late for you. The Lord is talking to us this morning about knowing him because he wants us to know him. God created us for us to have um, a relationship with him. And a relationship goes in a way for uh, one to know the other, for us to know each other. That's how a relationship works. That's how a relationship grows. And so God is calling you today to the knowledge of him. Would you um, welcome him into your life? And allow him, and, uh, and allow yourself to get to know him, and allow him to reveal himself to you. Do you uh, know God a little bit? Have you been a Christian maybe for years? But to be honest, all you know about God is head knowledge. There's nothing, or there's just so little that is experiential. Is it because you've been keeping God at, at a distance, you know, allowing Him fully and totally into your life. You know, because when we welcome God into our lives, we don't welcome Him to be a guest, but we welcome Him to be Lord. 
And so we welcome him in our lives, but then we submit to his lordship over our lives. And as he is lord in our lives, then the relationship between us and him as we submit to him, it thrives. Because then we make time for him, because then we are obedient to his ways. And ultimately, we foster or uh, that allows our relationship with God to grow. But then if we keep God at a distance, just allowing him to come closer or trying to get closer to him only when we are in need, then we are kind of like sabotaging um, that relationship. And so we might be Christians for so many years and then end up knowing this little about God. Sometimes we live life with God, we do life with God when everything is on high because we think God is amazing. And then when go, things start going um, sideways, instead of even holding on to God the more, we just try to think, take matters into, our, into our, our own hands. And by doing that, we fail to see how even God loves us, how God is there for us, how God can see us and will see us through um, the various stages of our lives, even and especially um, the painful and the hurtful and the difficult ones. If we know a lot about God, let's say, if we've been thriving in relationship with him ever since uh, we became Christians or uh, for the past few years or whatever, God is a God whom our minds, our human minds cannot uh, fathom, they cannot figure out, they cannot understand. And so there is always more to find out or to discover of the Lord and in the Lord. Even thinking about God, um, let's say, as a provider. Maybe you've lived with God, walked with God, realized he can provide 10 then you get to the place that you need a hundred and you wonder, oh, is God ever going to do it? Keep on relying upon God even for the hundred. Maybe you're going to get a thousand. And then you realize how indeed God <laughs> is a provider and he can provide above and beyond your needs. That there is nothing too big for God to do. Whatever stage um, you are at, whether you know him, whether you don't, whether you know him a little, whether you know him a lot. I just want to ask you today to commit to getting to know the Lord even more or to start to get to know the Lord if you, ha <clears throat> if you haven't done that yet. God is speaking to you this morning because he wants you to know him. He wants you to know him better. He wants you to know him well. I'm going to pray for us as I uh, invite the worship team back on stage. Thank you, Father, for being the amazing, wonderful, good, beautiful Lord that you are. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for being good and gracious, Lord. Thank you for calling us to you, Lord. We can say we know you. We can say <laughs> we have a knowledge about you, Lord God, because you revealed yourself to us, Lord God. And we thank you for that, Lord. As you call us into a deeper relationship with you, as you call us into a deeper knowledge of you, Father, we pray that you make our hearts soft, Lord God, this morning to receive what you have uh, shown into our hearts, Lord God. And to be obedient to what you are saying, Lord God. Father, you, you want us to know you. That is why you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world. You want us to be close to you. That is why 
how you made him a way for us to come to you, Lord. And I pray the Lord God, whoever is listening to my voice this morning, Lord God, I will feel the urge, Lord, of getting to know you, of getting to know you better, of getting to know you well, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, teach us to know you, Lord God, for who you are, Lord. Father, we might think that even we do know you, but there is so much more that we do not know. And I pray, Lord, that we will live life in its entirety with you, Lord God, allowing you to be King and Lord in every area of our lives, Lord God. And as we do so, Lord, we will get to know you, to be the healer that you are, to be the Savior that you are, to be the King that you are, to be the Almighty God that you are, to be the shepherd, the good shepherd that you are, Lord God. To be the God that you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.